Well, there's an old Jewish anecdote about Rabbi Hillel replying to a persistently inquisitive student who's constantly asking what the Torah means. And Hillel says, listen, here's the meaning of the Torah. Don't do to others what you would hate to have done to yourself. That's it. That's the whole Torah. The rest is explanation. Now, go learn. The Jewish people who wrote the poems, letters, essays, and other rhetoric in the Bible wrote with a sophisticated sense of metaphor and allegory. We tend to think of people in the ancient world as backwater and uneducated. Still, in many ways, they better understood how to interpret their holy stories than we. Especially since, as Hillel said, most studies focused on treating others the way we would like to be treated. Ancient Near Eastern literature, including the Bible, reflects remarkable adaptability and evolution of philosophical thought. Throughout the Bible, we come to understand how arduous it is to wrestle with questions about who we are, you know, existentialism, and what's holding the universe together. It's a sort of ontology. And as a bonus, the Bible's a written collection of ideas about these topics that began as oral traditions. So from Genesis to Revelation, we're also seeing something like 5,000 years of human wondering. That is a long time to think about what it means to be as well as what it means to be people in communion with God. Our ancestral wisdom seekers were perhaps more capable, or at least more willing than we, to rethink their ideas about God and God's interactions because of a tradition called Midrash. Postmodern spiritual seekers are rediscovering Midrash, which Hebrew Bible scholar Will de Gaffney describes as, quote, reimagining dominant narrative readings while crafting new ones to stand alongside, not replace, former readings. Midrash also asks questions of the text. Sometimes it provides answers. Sometimes it leaves the reader to answer the questions. Christians can think of Midrash as a form of exegesis, which is a big word Bible scholars like to use whenever you interpret a text in a way they don't like, which in my experience is pretty often. Still, Exegesis insists that we read biblical stories with as much understanding of the original context as possible, so we can learn what the texts meant to the people reading, listening to, and writing them thousands of years ago. After that, we can build on their ideas, or sometimes even reject them. Good, hard-researched exegesis is essential to understanding the contexts in which ancient people lived, their home and community life, their politics, economics, their religion. The Bible deals with all of this. It helps to know where people so far removed from our reality were coming from before we search for personal meanings. Finding ancient literary intent and understanding it is excruciating work that requires outside resources. Otherwise, we're going to commit the cardinal sin of theology, eisegesis, which happens when we read without acknowledgement of the personal biases and prejudices coloring our interpretation. Practicing Midrash doesn't mean we get to claim the text says anything we want. In fact, doing Midrash well makes us more aware of how our culture, personal and communal life, and religion might be coloring our interpretation. Midrash helps us read more spiritually, opening our minds to God's inclusive, infinite love. Midrash is a studied and carefully crafted argument, and one that I believe always refers to Hillel's golden rule. Treat others the way you'd like to be treated. Don't do to someone else what you hate having done to you. Now, I have to admit to some struggle with this golden rule. Some of us actually like things that other people don't like at all. Worse, treating you how I want to be treated smacks of selfishness and colonialism to me. Now, I have to say, Coincidentally, Trudy was at a conference this week, and one of the presenters also mentioned these issues with the Golden Rule, suggesting that we reframe it this way as treating others the way they want to be treated. I think that's a pretty good idea. Whatever motivates us to treat others with love and respect, 
We need to reread our holy texts if we're digging through a new interpretation of Scripture and concluding that it's okay to hate or enslave or otherwise lessen the value of another human being. We all commit a bit of eisegesis now and then, though, and to a certain extent, I think the authors expected that. Even thousands of years ago, we were products of our culture. We're more aware of that fact today. So, knowing that we're reading with many biases, not the least of which is a tendency to read everything from a contemporary viewpoint, knowing that helps us shed some of the more heinous ideas for which scripture has been used the past few thousand years. The wondrous literary collection we call the Bible is one allegorical, metaphoric parable after another. It's also a record of the interpretive debates people were having, of their midrash, recorded in private letters, synagogue missives, ontological poetry, existential pentameter, outright arguments, and a hundred other literary devices. The postmodern church understands the Bible in the more fluid way of the Jewish people who originally wrote the texts and embraced discussion about them. Furthermore, Jesus taught in the ancient, traditional Jewish way of asking questions and prodding his students to think more deeply about their beliefs. He doesn't want them to repeat his answers. He wants them to find their own answers, new answers, by thinking and praying perhaps more deeply than they ever have before. Jesus still demands that of us today. In one of the Bible's most famous passages, Jesus makes a series of statements that begin with, you have heard it said that, and then he summarizes a passage of scripture and reinterprets it. That is the essence of Midrash, my friends. And we see in the Second Testament powerful pushback from the religious authorities who thought that they had it all figured out. It's okay for them to discuss the many meanings of scripture, but far be it for someone else to challenge their interpretations. It's typical. Because Christians have generally neglected Midrash, and often condemned it with threats of execution and book burnings, my next several installments are going to take a page from Jesus' playbook as we re-examine some famous passages of Scripture to see if we think they mean what we're most often told they mean. So, if you have a favorite, confounding, or otherwise interesting piece of Scripture you'd like to discuss, please send it to me at info at gowiththecurrent.org and I'll do my best to write about it and bring it forward for discussion here at The Current. Amen. Our question today is, what freedoms or limitations influence your midrashing? What freedoms or limitations influence your midrashing? And sisters, really...